Josh Mandel bows out of the race for U.S. Senate. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Derek Clay, Democratic strategist. In a stunning Friday afternoon email, Josh Mandel announced he is leaving the race for U.S. Senate. The reason? A family health issue. The statement reads, quote, we recently learned my wife has a health issue that will require my time and attention and presence. In other words, I need to be there. Understanding and dealing with this health issue is more important to me than any political campaign. After recent discussions with our family and healthcare professionals, it has become clear to us that it's no longer possible for me to be away from home and on the campaign trail needed for the needed time to run for U.S. Senate. That leaves Cleveland businessman Mike Gibbons as the only announced Republican to run against Sherrod Brown. We'll get to how this shakes up the race in a moment. But Terry Casey, this was a surprise. Had you any warning this was happening? What, did, what have you heard? Well, it is a big, big surprise. And a lot of people don't realize he and his wife have three very young children, I think, in the range of roughly one to six years old. Uh, and so I'm taking it at his word it was a family problem. There is speculation that maybe he was afraid of losing. Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly correct. Ultimately, we'll find out. But it definitely shakes things up. And one of the questions is, does somebody like a Mary Taylor or a Jim Renacci switch from running for governor in order to run for the Senate race? Because it's important for the Republican Party that Sherrod Brown have some good competition. Uh, and his feet be held to the fire because he's been in D.C. so long as a senator and congressman. But, but the tone of the email, Julie, makes it sound like this is a, this is was a sudden, suddenly occurring health issue because Josh Mandel is a very ambitious guy. Yes. And I think that it would have taken a lot to get him to pull out of the race, even if he did face long odds. I think so. And he is actually has gone into this decision as, I think, the number one fundraiser in a Senate race in the United States. Mm -hmm. That includes sitting senators and everything. He's a very good fundraiser. He was mounting a campaign against Brown that was his second time doing that and thinking he had positioned himself better. Nobody knew the name of Mike Gibbons, so um, I don't really think that... Um, although we should talk about that. Yeah. But uh, I don't really think there's anything to it but what it says on his face. Andy. Well, no, Julie's right. I mean, he's he's not only a big fundraiser, but he, he works really hard to make a lot of contacts. He's, he's a very ambitious guy who's been able to, to rise through the ranks in Ohio. And I think with all these... Uh, the shuffling around that we've seen. I mean, we've seen basically two candidates for every single statewide race, but then one after another, people have been dropping out. And I think Josh Mandel was the one person you really thought, there's no way he's drop dropping out of this race. He's the one uh, con constant thing that you could count on in this race. So for him to drop out is very surprising. And one of the real positives that he looked at was this was going to be a gubernatorial turnout year, which is very different than presidential. When he came close, not that close, the last time it was presidential and he was running against the Obama turnout machine. Mm -hmm. He right. wouldn't wouldn't have had that in 18. Yeah. Derek, does this mean it's Mike Gibbons and Sherrod Brown? Or do you expect Sherrod Brown to face a bigger name GOP candidate come uh, November? Yeah, well, first off, I, I pray that everything is okay with, with Josh and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Mike, Mike Gibbons, nobody knew his name before uh, Josh uh, Mandel announced that he was stepping out of the race and Quite frankly, people don't know his name now. So I think that this paves the way for Senator Brown to be reelected. Now, if, um, <clears throat> I don't think that the governor is going to jump into the race. I think that he's concentrating on 2020 for uh, another presidential run. And some of the other folks that are in the statewide races, uh, Mary Taylor, I don't think that she could, she could beat Sherrod Brown. Uh, if you look at a Dave Yost, I don't think that he can beat a Sherrod Brown. So I think that we're, that, that, the senator is in a very good position right now to not only get reelected, but to help some of the other statewide that are running for, 
for our election in 2018. I will say Mike Gibbons has uh, John Kasich's former spokesperson with him. He has Donald Trump's digital team with him, and he's gotten the endorsement of, I think, the Franklin County GOP. So he has had some momentum and some heavyweights behind but was, him. Wasn't that more of an anti-Josh Mandel endorsement? I think it was, the, yeah. So, so now they might change their endorsement if a Mary Taylor. And, or, and Josh Mandel's people dropped the ball in Franklin County because Gibbons made calls personally not once, but twice to every member of the Central Committee here, and Josh should have known something was coming and you need to make sure you don't have a surprise in Franklin County. But as much as um, that was a negative uh, nod at Josh, things like the Cleveland Police Union endorsing Josh were interesting because they appeared to have been lined up well before Gibbons got in the race. So yeah. when I interviewed them about the endorsing Josh, and I said, is this an endorsement for the general or is this an endorsement against Gibbons? They said, who's Gibbons? Never had heard of him and we're endorsing. Mandel. So in a way, um, the Republicans will line up behind who they think is the best candidate and put all those resources, the National Republican Senatorial Campaigns already in the state, uh, and very interested in winning that seat, as Terry says. So we have the, th the two other candidates. Mike DeWine has to be the favorite for governor, so he's not going to jump in. But you have Jim and AC, Terry. You have Mary Taylor, the two other announced candidates for governor. And John Houston has to be thinking, you know, maybe I'll run for Senate and not for lieutenant governor. Or does he stay with DeWine? I mean, I, I it really he, shakes things up. Well, for John Houston, his issue interest is state issues, not the federal issues. And it is a big jump. You know, it's one thing at the state house, the kind of issues that you deal with, the budget and all that. The federal level is a totally different game. He might think about it. He might get some pressure. Uh, but I think he's going to stay because governor is what he ultimately wants to be, and he sees a path forward being a running mate with uh, Mike but, DeWine. So does Renee see consider it? I, I don't know whether he considers it because basically he wanted to get out of Congress because mm -hmm. he, he was a business guy who got elected to Congress and realized what a screwball business it is mm -hmm. in how we run our national legislative uh, affairs. Yeah. All the he rhetoric. Might some, he might get some pressure from Trump, though, to jump in that Senate race to offset the Doug oh. Jones victory right. in Alabama. But all the rhetoric behind Renese has been, I want to come to Ohio, I want to be the executive of Ohio, so it kind of goes against the grain if he ran for Senate. Right. If he should do that, opening up the possibility that Mary Taylor could run for his seat, although she's already said she doesn't want to do that. And I do believe that Mary Taylor is in the governor's race for the long haul, although she hasn't announced a lieutenant governor yet, and the time is, is getting short for doing that. So that gets to my, my, Sherrod Brown's going to be tough to beat. We're looking at possibly a Democratic wave year, a lot of anti-Donald Trump sentiment out there. <clears throat> Could these folks, these big name Republicans say, you know what, I should jump in for the team, give a strong opponent, but I'm not going to do it and get my, my butt beat. Mm. Well, Sherrod has a lot of strengths, but he has a lot of weaknesses because he's been around so long. And one of the things people are unhappy about is the gridlock and the people in D.C. knowing not doing anything, and Sherrod is kind of, he's been there forever. He's a career politician. I think he started out at, what, age 21, first as a state rep. So uh, he's got some baggage. He's got some pluses. Uh, we'll see. But there is a month till filing yes, deadline. There. I, I, don't think that, I don't think that longevity in Congress equates to you being vulnerable for office. He is one of the most popular uh, uh, politicians and, and elected officials that this state has ever seen. So I think that he is in a really good position to be reelected to, to the U.S. Senate. And I think that, he, again, he's going to be in a position where he's going to be helping the other statewide candidates that are running for on, the, on the Democratic side of the aisle. And if we really want to look way ahead of the game, if you really think about Sherrod Brown having a really big win this year in the Senate race, that could set him up for any possible run for president in the future, too. Pat Tiberi, a congressman from Central Ohio, said he will not run for Senate. So there's one speculation off the board already. Next topic. One way or another, it looks like Ohio voters will decide whether to change the way we draw congressional districts. As you likely know, the Republican-dominated legislature drew a very creative congressional map in 2012, resulting in gerrymandered districts that mostly favor Republicans. Supporters of redistricting reform are collecting signatures to put an issue on the November ballot. Voters overwhelmingly approved a similar proposal to change the state districts a few years ago. That has lawmakers nervous, so they are rushing to preempt the November issue by trying to get a different plan on the May ballot. 
Andy, is that the motivation here? They want to, the legislature wants to control the process of drawing these districts. They're afraid of the November issue. They, they make no secret on the fact that legislators want to create the laws that, that are in Ohio. They don't want a citizen's ballot initiative to come in to kind of change the game. So yeah, they have Democrats and Republicans working together right now uh, to try to come up with some sort of bipartisan deal. Remember, we already have a reform to the way state legislative districts are drawn. A lot of people are saying, just use that same same process for the congressional districts. So th there's, there's something out there, there's a plan out there already that they could draw upon. So I think that in the next month or two, we are gonna see some movement on this. But Julie, the worry is that this will just be a cosmetic fix. It won't be real reform. Right. How, how, how likely is it to just be a cosmetic fix? Well, I feel like they're motivated at a deeper level than that because of the fact that everybody knows this is a swing state. Things happen, um, shifts happen, and the Republicans can only go on controlling every branch of government for so long. And so it makes some sense that they would want to compromise with Democrats now as opposed to later. And there are Democrats made that mistake in 2000 before 2010. Right. They didn't take the compromise. <laughs> then they lost everything in 20, right. 2010. Right. And there's two African American Democrat members of Congress who like things the way they are, including Joyce Beatty, and the risk of some computer drawn thing. The other problem that's misleading because people have never been involved in the process is. If you only have 16 or ultimately 15 congressional districts, they can't all be compact and competitive and all these other kind of things, particularly when a lot of the federal judges have said every district must be exact down to the person. There's some debate whether that'll be the ultimate standard, and we're still waiting on the U.S. Supreme Court a case on the Wisconsin, what they do and don't do. So it's not as simple to draw easy, compact districts. Yeah. The first two or three or four you draw can all look very pretty and nice, and people say, boy, that's great. But then you got all these bits and pieces around Ohio, and where do you stick them? It's hard yeah. to make every district perfect. And that's, and that's easy to do if you're in some of the bigger counties, like right. Fra Franklin County or Cuyahoga County or even, even Hamilton. But when you get into some of the smaller counties, you can't, it's going to be really hard to try to uh, not break up the the county uh, lines in order to in order to uh, get a congressional district all into one and compact. Es and especially if it's got to be yeah. exactly to the person right. in the numbers, and then with computers, you got to grab little bits and pieces of five people here yeah. and twenty six people. But here. you still you, but you still have a congressional district that goes from. Jim Jordan's district, Tea Party favorite, from Southwest Ohio all the way up to Lorain County in Oberlin. That's not just because they had to have the exact number of people I, in the district. I understand, and you know what, in their states like California where they've got Democrats doing yes. chairman. So I mean, it happens and computers have kind of made it worse but I just want to give people a buyer beware. Yeah. There's no way you can have yeah. a perfect district of 15 or 16 congressional districts that all look perfectly perfect and that are exactly competitive. Yeah. Right, so but you, you have... will notice that around the cities, you know, it's something logical for us in Columbus, for example, you know, pull in some Worthington and uh, maybe Westerville and Bexley voters, but you'll notice that a lot of times that doesn't happen because those are Republican yeah. areas as opposed to the Democratic. It, absolutely, and I think I think legislators are in a very tough spot on this one. I, they're getting pressure not only from their constituents that want to see something happen with redistricting, but their peers are looking at them as well, and they're like, you know, the congressional members are looking at the state legislators and saying, hey, yeah, I know you got to do something, but really, you know, <laughs> you're talking about our, 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 our elections. And Terry, so, well, Terry well. mentioned that, and there is, there is a, Joyce Beatty says the current maps allow for African American representation in Congress, no minority representation in Congress. Absolutely. So, where's the balance there in trying to design maps that foster that diversity in Congress, but also foster competitive districts and perhaps more compromise? Well, you have to have, you have, to have diversity within your, con your congressional districts. Uh, you know, if, if you look at, if you look at uh, Congresswoman Beatty's district, a lot of her district is in the central, central parts of, of Columbus, in Franklin County, you know, and then they go a little bit up into, you know, the, the northern parts of the county. But 
you know, you have to you have to have some diversity, yep. and, and it is a fine line of how you draw those districts versus whether it looks like you're intentionally gerrymandering the districts. Yeah, and that's why you have guardrails to try to make sure that you, you're splitting things evenly, but the, creating a process where the minority gets a vote, where the minority party gets a vote, mm -hmm. I think that's the big swing there that a lot of people want. And some of the districts, like up in Cleveland, Fudge, where the, her district shrunk up so much in population, they had to go down into the central city African-American areas of Akron in order to get enough numbers to pump her numbers up so she would be safer, which is what she wanted. Mm -hmm. All right. With the new year comes the next court fight over Ohio voting. On Wednesday, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments supporting and opposing Ohio's system of purging inactive voters from the rolls. Under Ohio's rules, you can be purged from the rolls if you have not voted in six years, even if that voter remains eligible to vote and has not moved. Supporters say purging the rolls prevents fraud. Opponents say Republicans are just trying to suppress the vote of people likely to vote for Democrats. Julie Carsmyth, why are they, what is the reason behind purging the, the, the voters for being inactive? Well, uh, it's a, it's a record keeping uh, mechanism that we've had for a long time in Ohio. This rule that's at issue has been around since 1994, you know, and the idea is obviously if people die or if they move or if they're double or triple registered at different locations where they've lived around the state, then there's a possibility that they're going to vote or get an opportunity to vote twice or three times. Uh, it rarely, rarely happens, but, you know, the idea of the lawsuit is to say it's not it's not appropriate for you to just simply say non-voters uh, should be removed. Uh, I interviewed someone who basically said, you know, for example, take last year, there were many voters in, across the country that did not, they, they chose not to vote as a, an act of protest. They didn't like Trump, they didn't like Clinton, and that should be their right, and that shouldn't mean that they are somehow deprived of the right. Some folks only vote in presidential elections. Right. So if you skip one, you're going to be inactive for six years. Right. Right. And I haven't been on the Franklin County Board of Elections for 14 years. Some of this purging goes back to when Sherrod Brown was actually Secretary of State. A lot of these things were done when Jennifer Bruner, Democrat, was Secretary of State. But part of it is it not only adds to the administrative cost, but for campaigns on both sides, if you've got lots of names that are inactive, and it's not that hard if you choose not to vote even six, eight, ten years in a row, you'll get a notice and just say, keep me on the rolls. If you sign a petition for somebody, that counts in terms of keeping your activity. So it's really pretty easy to register to vote, and they aren't just purging people because you miss one yeah. election. I, you, listen, I think that um, if, if you die, if you move, or if you're not supposed to be voting for 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 some le, le, legal and legitimate reason, you should be taken off the rolls. But I think the problem that people have is that we're not trying to find ways in which to get more people to register to vote. And we should be encouraging voter uh, participation versus discouraging it. So I think that that's one of the reasons why you have this lawsuit is because, you know, who, who is it to say, who is it to say because I don't vote for a couple of cycles, I should be taken off the off the roll? But you won't be taken off if you don't vote for two cycles. It, it effectively takes eight years of inactivity, unresponding, nothing coming back. You need to do presidential office. cycles. If you only vote in the presidential races and you miss one, one, you could be taken off. Well, but effectively, you're going to get notices that say, yeah. do you want to still be kept on the rolls. Right. But I mean, it is, a, it is a layer of bureaucracy. I mean, a lot of people uh, would say, well, when I'm 18, I'd like to be able to go in and register and remain registered for my whole life. So there has to be this balance, and that's what the court has to decide, you know? What is a re re reasonable amount of, of um, uh, monitoring of that list. And Mike, you mentioned there were a lot of people who didn't want to vote because it was a Trump versus Clinton kind of race, but there were a lot of people who were who felt excited to vote for the first time in many years because of whatever the situation was. So it happened that way too, where people went to the the uh, precincts to vote and, and they weren't on the rolls. And I'm old enough to remember when the only way you could register to vote was to go downtown to the Board of Elections. And now it's every library, BMV, it's vote by mail, uh, I mean, it's real easy to be registered. And you can uh, register online now. A absolutely. So this complaint of trying to suppress people's right to vote is totally false. It's easy, but as a voter, you might occasionally have to actually 
vote or say to the Board of Elections when they send you a note, yeah, keep me on the rolls and remember, stay on the rolls. Yeah, but just remember that John Husted, the current Secretary of State, had been sending out these notices every second year and under a previous court order, he now sends them out every year, okay. so. Anyway, our last topic, just as Ohio gets ready to start selling legal medical marijuana, the federal government brings uncertainty to the system. Marijuana is still against federal law, but the Obama administration basically ignored the law in states that legalized it. This week, new attorney general, relatively new attorney general, Jeff Sessions announced the Justice Department could start cracking down on marijuana. He's leaving it up to local federal prosecutors. Ohio's federal prosecutor says Sessions' action won't change things here and the state is moving ahead with establishing the medical marijuana program. Julie Carsmith, what is the U.S. Attorney for Southern Ohio saying? Well, I mean, the idea is that our state legislature has now uh, made this legal, and it is a state's rights issue, and according to the, um, according to the legal experts here, they're saying that we have the right to go forward with that with that program. And I find it fascinating to hear liberals from California waving the flag of states' rights because in the past they would demean and attack people from other parts of the country who waved states' rights. But it does seem like the Justice Department is shifting the policy, but they're not saying go out and really go after people that hard. So I think if you're in California and they get a little too carried away with recreational marijuana, the feds might step in and tighten some things down, but it's a shift, but I don't think yeah. it's a dramatic it, shift. This is going to be tied up for, for years if you get a prosecution because you have states like uh, Washington that ha has had marijuana legal for five years. And, and now you're going to tell them, you're going to have a prosecutor go and prosecute uh, either growers or, or, or people that are, are purchasing this. This is going to be tied up in court forever. Yeah, there's a couple of things that protect Ohio's medical marijuana because there, there is a provision in federal law that, that protects medical marijuana. It might expire, but it might be yeah, it's up the, soon. It's a budget amendment. Yeah. It is law, though. Yeah, yeah as, as of right now. And, uh, and then the other thing we're talking about is that the U.S. attorney doesn't seem to think this is a big deal to go after because Ohio has such a much bigger problem with opioids right now that, that dealing with marijuana and whatever crisis might come from marijuana is, is second nature. But, this, but this, this assumes that Jeff Sessions will be attorney general forever. <laughs> and the U.S. Attorney for Southern Ohio will be in that position forever. If somebody new comes in, right. they could make this really anyone's game. And these folks in Ohio are investing a lot of money on establishing well, this. Right, and I think that that's what has happened with, uh, obviously, Obama had one perception of it, his Justice Department versus this new administration. Um, and this affects not only growers and users, this affects the testing labs. You saw men, uh, no universities, or only two, wanted to even get involved because it's potentially up against that federal law. Banks don't really yeah. want to get involved in that kind of thing. I mean, what the federal government says on this still has a big impact. This, and banks have been staying out of it for a while now because of this exact nature of the business where you, you never know what's going to happen. But it's real simple. It's the law. If you don't like the law, then change the law. Well, that, Derek, does that what do you think of the chances of Congress legalizing at least medical marijuana? I, I think that I think that Congress will eventually legalize medical marijuana. Recreational, I think we're a few years from that, but I think that public demand for for this will dictate some of that in in how congressional members think about this as well. Is this just Terry Jeff Sessions mad at California for because of January first, recreational marijuana became legal there. Biggest, well, you know, biggest state, you know, biggest. Well, and, and California has been strutting pretty big in saying, oh, we got pot and it's for whatever you want to do. So I think part of it is if, if you did it in a more subtle, controlled manner, you're less likely to get attention. If California gets too carried away, then there could be some action come. Right. And I think that, you know, the idea is the more states that open that door to medical marijuana, and then you get critical mass of 25 states, all of a sudden it's nationally legal everywhere. Is that what, 34 states it's legal for medical marijuana mm -hmm. now, something like that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Over 30 anyway. Yeah. Right. All right, let's get to our weekly off the record. Final parting shots. Derek Clay, you're up first. So this week was a pretty historic week over at the Franklin County Commissioner's Office. Uh, Kevin Boyce was just uh, named the president of the Franklin County Commissioners, and he's not only the first African American Franklin County Commissioner, but he's also the first president, African-American president, along with Shannon Harton, who was 
sworn in as council president this week. All right. Terry. Uh, in Columbus, there's been a little story this past week on the murder rate. Columbus just set a new record. And the amazing thing, my prediction is there's going to be a lot more debate on why don't we have more police? Because in 09, when they passed the 25% increase in the city income tax, they promised more police. But actually, when you compare 09 to the end of 16, we've got 25 less sworn police officers, even though the population's up 9.5%, the drug and the other problems. So I think the FOP is going to say, where'd you use the money? Even Hugh Dorian agreed <laughs> City Hall has spent the money on programs instead of police. Julie. I'm going to say uh, a Republican other than Mike Gibbons will be will be a long shot and that they may just let him be the sacrificial lamb um, and Brown will win in the fall. Okay. Andy. The legislature is going to come back into session next week and, and a bill that I think is really interesting that might come back is this this idea of banning employers from banning from forcing employees to get the flu shot because a lot of employees say we don't want to get the flu shot. How big is Donald Trump this week? There was a major snowstorm, a bomb cyclone on the East Coast. In the cable news networks, on the day this storm was bearing down, hardly mentioned it. Instead, they talked about the battle between Donald Trump and Steve Bannon. So there you go. That's, he's turned cable news on its ear, and they don't cover weather anymore. That's how powerful he is. <laughs> that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the discussion on Facebook, on Twitter, and you can watch every episode on demand at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.